So many of you know that one of the traditions of the early church was that there would be letters that would be written and sent to the church, especially the churches that Paul founded. There were no written gospels yet, and so Paul would establish a church and then he would write a letter to the church to continue relationship. And then those letters were often read in worship. So in that spirit, I'd like to share with you a letter that I wrote this week. Uh, perhaps some of you saw this on social media. I was uh, inclined to write this letter after I got an email from the Franklin Graham campaign uh, asking churches in Southern California if they might attend rallies of his California tour. As you can probably guess, I'm not a big fan of Franklin Graham. I think he often uses his national platform to spread messages contrary to the gospel. So, in the tradition of the early church, I'd like to share with you a modern epistle, an open letter to Franklin Graham. Dear Reverend Franklin Graham, thank you so much for your kindness in thinking about the people of University Christian Church on your upcoming tour of California. I appreciate the invitation, but I think that I will have to respectfully decline. While I firmly believe in ecumenism and supporting the efforts of my fellow siblings in Christ, I think that you must have a different copy of the Bible than I do, because so many of your public statements seem to brush aside basic biblical values. For instance, I simply cannot support someone who perpetuates dangerous Islamophobia calling for the Iraq war and calling Islam a very dangerous and wicked religion, goes against both the gospel of Jesus Christ and everything that I know to be true. The perpetuation of Islamophobia is one reason why last month people thought it was okay to participate in Punish a Muslim Day, which called for violent acts against Muslims. Our congregation participated in a protest of the violence by placing a banner across the front pillars of our church reading, we love our Muslim neighbors. We also invited in two Muslim men whose sons were murdered by gangs. Despite the horrendous acts of violence committed against their families, because of their faith, these incredible fathers forgave the men who murdered their sons. When Jesus called us to love our neighbors, I don't think he gave us a choice of which neighbors we were going to love, quite the opposite, in fact. The only way we truly love God is by loving all our neighbors, even enemies, as ourselves. See Matthew 5 and Matthew 22. <laughs> you also spoke openly against the LGBTQ plus community and supported legislation that actively oppresses people because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. I suppose we have different theologies about what it means to be created in the divine image. Whenever I read the first creation story in the book of Genesis that states that God looked at all humanity, God created all of humanity in God's own image and called it good, I read that LGBTQ plus persons were created in God's own image and declared good by God's own voice. Additionally, Jesus never condemned the LGBTQ plus community. In fact, I believe he had something to say about those who wanted to judge on God's behalf. See Matthew 7. <laughs> a careful student also knows that it's very possible that the first Gentile to be baptized was likely gay. See Acts 8. <laughs> Perhaps most reprehensible is your endorsement of Donald Trump for President of the United States, despite his repeated vulgarity and anti-Christian attitudes and actions. He claims to be a Christian, yet clearly has no familiarity with the Bible or Christian teachings. Dehumanization of immigrants, documented or not, is clearly an ethical violation of the biblical mandate to welcome the stranger, the foreigner in our land. See Deuteronomy 10, Leviticus 19, Matthew 25, Hebrews 13, 1 Peter 4, to name a few. The current president also shamelessly degrades women, which not only disgraces the divine image, but also shows an incredible lack of knowledge about the importance of women in Jesus' life and ministry. If that hadn't been for women funding Jesus' ministry, he wouldn't have been able to spread the message throughout Galilee. And if it hadn't been for women at the tomb, no one would have even known about the resurrection. It wouldn't be quite so bad, Reverend Graham, except that you have a national platform and a voice which could be used for great good, but is instead used to spread messages of hate and oppression under the guise of Christianity. This, I'm afraid, makes you an antichrist. 
which in the New Testament was not used to identify one specific person, but rather anyone who acted counter to the teachings of Christ. Unfortunately, sometimes people with the loudest voice speak words that drive others away from the faith. The hypocrisy of living a life that is so clearly incongruous with Jesus' teachings is evident and is causing many people to leave the church. These are a few of the reasons why I have to respectfully decline your offer to attend your tour of Southern California. I don't speak on behalf of my congregation or make decisions for them. They're absolutely free to attend your rally if they so choose. But I doubt that they will, unless they're going to protest. In Christ, the Reverend Caleb J. Lines. P.S., just in case you accidentally got a faulty copy of the Bible, I'm happy to send you a new one in which I will highlight all of the passages that I mentioned and more. Now, I don't claim to speak on behalf of this congregation. I don't claim to speak on behalf of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, and I certainly don't claim to speak on God's behalf. And certainly, one of the things that makes this congregation unique is that we're willing to come together and have a diversity of beliefs, freedom of interpretation, right? Yet, I think we have to name theology that just brushes aside the biblical mandate of love. That's our responsibility as people of faith. And we see over and over again that mandate in the Bible, including in today's scripture lesson. Today's scripture lesson comes from John 15. It's a part of the farewell discourse. And Jesus gives this wonderfully succinct version of the Bible, the whole gospel in just two sentences. He says, as God has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. Since I have loved you, so you shall love one another. That's the gospel. That is the hope of our faith. It was the hope of the early church. It's the hope of the current church, that we might know God's love through Christ, that we might be inspired by that love to share love with one another, to live in service to one another, and that through that experience, people might know God. Period. That's what we're called to do. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, Caleb, is writing a scathing letter really loving? To which I would reply, yes. And here's why. I think it's what the apostles did in the early church. It's what Paul did whenever he wrote the epistles, the only, the newest or the oldest writings that we have in the New Testament. He, he wrote against things that he considered to be blasphemous to the faith. And I think it's what Jesus spent his whole life in ministry doing, is calling out the religious and social hypocrisy in his day. It's why he was executed. If it weren't for that, he wouldn't have needed to add the next line. There is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. He called out the hypocrisy, and it got him crucified. You see, I think we as people of faith have an obligation to call out bad theology. This doesn't surprise you. We just spent six weeks talking about bad theology. And how do we identify what's good theology and what's bad theology? I think the answer is actually pretty clear. Does it pass the criterion of love? I've said this before and I'll say it many more times. Theology must pass the criterion of love. Theology must pass the criterion of love or else it's bad theology and we need to get rid of it. We are called to love one another. Another way to say that is we cannot be tolerant of intolerance. Or as William Sloan Coffin said, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. <laughs> we cannot be tolerant of intolerance because when we try to tolerate intolerance, intolerance always wins. We've seen this over and over again in history. And it looks a lot like punish a Muslim day or beating up a gay couple in Hillcrest or pushing aside homeless neighbors. We know what intolerance looks like and we can't stand for it. Yes, there is welcome, but people's actions limit their welcome. And when people aren't loving, we are called as people of faith to say, no, you're not speaking on behalf of the God that I know. 
So my hope for us today is that in the spirit of Christ, we will stand up and say no to any theology that does not pass the criterion of love. May it be so. Amen. Me detuve a su grado, a la fuera del camino.